All right, peace. I am Tahuti Ra'iteru. And this video right here is to put an end to this grand deception once and for all. Now, as a disclaimer, I want to say that this video is only for the advanced truth seeker, people who are familiar with hearing real truths. But if you are a beginner, meaning that you only just woke up, then this video is not for you. I would recommend that you go and watch my chakra videos and my other videos on my channel to bring you up to speed. The reason I say this is because in another one of my videos, I don't think I made it clear enough that it was for the advanced truth seekers only. And as a result, I upset quite a few people who had fragile consciousness. But this video right here is to silence the critics, or should I say the crickets who are just hopping around out here because their one purpose in life has left YouTube now. So they're just hopping on propaganda bandwagons. But after this video, these crickets will have no legs to stand on and there'll be no more hopping around. But in this video, I am going to be dealing with strictly the information. I am not going to slander, call people names or resort to personal attacks. Because quite frankly, when you have the information, you don't need to do that. So with that being said, if any one of these critics decide to respond to this video and they resort to slander and personal attacks, then they have already lost. Alright, so with that being said, let's get straight into this video. The Serpents of India The Serpents of India were known as the Nagas, which is a Sanskrit word meaning serpent. A male is called Naga and a female is called Nagini. These Nagas were a group of spiritual adepts who had awakened the dormant Kundalini serpent. By doing so, these spiritual adepts gained a magnitude of wisdom and were able to produce various esoteric scripts that influenced the creation of modern Buddhism and yogic practices. Once the Kundalini serpent had been awakened, these spiritual adepts may often incorporate Naga into their names, hence Nagarjuna or Naga Arjuna, who was a Buddhist philosopher. Some legends say that Buddha gave wisdom sutras to the Nagas to watch over them as he said the world was not ready for their teachings. Then centuries later, these Nagas befriended Nagarjuna and gave their teachings to him. From there, he developed his Buddhist philosophies. Now the Naga are said to be mythical creatures who dwell under the earth within the Naga Loka, also known as Patala. And Patala is said to be a watery realm. But the location of the Nagas is not limited to water. Nagas are also said to exist within the sky and in the heavens. But depending on the location of the Naga would determine its type and its specific role. So the water Nagas are said to reside deep within the earth in palaces filled with gold, ruby and emerald. Water Nagas are also said to be located at the bottom of various rivers, lakes and springs. Here, they are guardians of precious metals and wisdom sutras. Now, the sky nagas are said to form clouds and are capable of producing rain, which can be used for watering crops or for causing floods. Then the heavenly nagas are said to guard the temples of the gods. Now, the water is also symbolic of the primeval waters of creation. As in the Hindu creation myth, the god Narayana, also known as Vishnu, is sleeping or resting on top of a body of a serpent known as Shisha, who is called Ananta, which means endless. Here the universe is in its pralaya stage, which means dissolution, and in this stage, everything in the universe retreats back into itself, and the remainder of the universe, which is represented by the serpent Shisha, is being preserved by the god Vishnu, ready for creation to begin anew. Now the cosmic ocean is known as Garbhadukha, which is located at the bottom of the universe, and the serpent Shisha, who is often depicted with seven heads, he churns this cosmic ocean to form the shapes of the universe. But the creation of the universe begins when the creator god Brahma is born on top of a lotus from the navel of Vishnu. But when the universe is ready to be dissolved, the god Shiva is born from Brahma. There is also a Naga named Vasuki who is the king of the Nagas, and Vasuki is the serpent that Shiva wears around his neck. But the serpent Shisha is also said to be the king of the Nagas. Furthermore, when it comes to the physical appearance of the Nagas, 
they are often depicted as having a serpent lower body and a human upper body, or in full serpentine form with one or many heads, or as humans with serpents crowning the head or serpents coming from the neck. The Nagas also have hoods, and Nagas are said to raise their hoods to protect the Buddha. Also within their hoods, the Nagas have gems, and these gems shine a light brighter than diamond and it allows the Naga to dispel darkness in all directions. This jewel is said to form in the throat of the Naga, and in India this jewel is known as the Nagamani. The Nagas also come in the form of a dragon or a crocodile, and in China the Nagas are known as the Long Dragon, and the Long Dragon is said to be responsible for rain that brings fertility to the land. Lastly, the eternal enemy of the Naga is the Garuda, a mythological bird. And the story between the Naga and the Garuda is the Nagas kidnapped the mother of the Garuda, and the Garuda stole some Amrita as ransom to get their mother back. And Amrita is the elixir that grants immortality upon the gods. But before the Nagas could get a taste of this elixir, it was stolen back by Indra, but some drops of this elixir fell to earth and the Nagas slid their way through it. Thus they were now able to renew their skin by shedding. So this is why the serpent is a symbol of immortality. But see, all of this information right here is symbolic as the ancients would interpret the divine as symbols. So this is how they were able to preserve deep concepts and pass on the teachings through the generations as the less advanced people would see these as simple stories and mythology, but the more advanced people would be able to decode the stories and extract the deeper teachings. So now, if we break all of this down, the first thing we must be clear about is that the Naga is not actually a real being. The Naga is referring to the Kundalini energy that lays dormant at the base of the spine, and through the awakening of the Kundalini is how you become a Naga. But another important factor is that the Kundalini lays dormant in the root chakra, which is associated with the earth element, and the abode of the Nagas is called Patala. And if you remember from my chakra presentation, I told you that there are seven more chakras below the root chakra. The first being Atala, then Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and then the lowest is Patala. And these chakras relate to the other life forms and the planes of existence below Earth. But in the Vedas, they are collectively known as Bilasvarga, which means subterranean heavens. So these realms are not hells, but they are heavens. So the key thing to note here is that the chakras comprise their own dimensions. So what this is symbolically talking about is the Kundalini being dormant deep within the root chakra. In addition, being that the Patala is a heavenly realm, this could also be symbolic of the serpentine life force at the beginning of creation, as the cosmic ocean known as Garbadaka is below the Patala, and when creation commences, the body of the primal serpent expands, and the essence comprising the expanding body of the primal serpent, in India it was known as Prana, and in China it was known as Chi which is said to be the breath of the celestial dragon. Also in the legend about Nagarjuna, it is said that the Nagas befriended him and gave him the wisdom sutras. But what this symbolically means is that he awakened the Kundalini and through revelation he was able to gain wisdom and enlightenment to develop the Buddhist philosophies. It is also said that a yellow dragon gave the knowledge of writing to the Chinese emperor Fushi but again, this is symbolic of the emperor awakening the Kundalini and through revelation, he was able to develop writing. Furthermore, the Nagas are depicted with serpent lower bodies and human upper bodies. This symbolizes the union of Shakti and Shiva and also symbolizes the androgynous nature of the spiritual adept who has awakened the Kundalini and merged the masculine and the feminine. Then the part about the Naga's hoods shielding the Buddha and protecting him from the elements is talking about how the Buddha is protected by their own wisdom and enlightenment due to their ability to discern from falsehood. 
Also, the hood is said to shield them from the elements. So it is talking about how once a person has awakened the Kundalini, they go beyond the realm of the physical elements and they are in a whole new reality and have transcended the mundane elements. Lastly, the gem that is in the hood of the Naga is the pineal gland, as this gem allows the Naga to dispel darkness, and darkness is ignorance. So this is talking about how once a person has activated their pineal gland, they would be able to pierce the veil of ignorance and reveal all truths. In addition, this gem is said to form in the throat and the throat chakra in Sanskrit is known as Vishuddha which means purity. So this means that in order for a person to awaken the pineal gland and pierce the veil of ignorance, they have to be pure and have good intentions. So again, the Naga is not actually a real being, but by personifying the Kundalini as a real being is how the ancients were able to preserve the knowledge by incorporating it into mythology and symbols. So that way, people would pass on the stories, but then the more advanced people would be able to decode it and retrieve the knowledge. So the important thing here is that, in Eastern culture, the Naga is not actually said to be evil. The Naga has always been associated with knowledge, protection, wealth, fertility, and immortality. It's only now with Western culture that the Naga is seen as evil. So all of these people talking about the serpent being evil have not researched the information as clearly these people have a personal vendetta against the serpent and their ideologies are not based on facts but instead negative emotions. But we're going to deal with that today. Alright, so let's go to the next one. The Serpents of Egypt The serpents in Egypt were known as the Dijedi, who were priests that had been initiated into the Dijedi mystery schools and took initiation into the Great Pyramid. A successful initiate would have awakened their Kundalini, which was identified with the serpent Wajet coming out of the forehead. But the prefix DJ is what denotes the serpent. So you have Wajet, the patron and protector of Lower Egypt. Then you have the deity Tehuti, who is also known as Jehuti, with the same DJ prefix, which denotes serpent. So what this means is that if you identify with the Corpus Hermeticum, which is ancient Greek slash Egyptian wisdom attributed to the god Tehuti, or if you identify with any other text that is associated with the Hermetica such as the Kabbalion and the Emerald Tablets, then you are identifying with Serpent Wisdom. Now Egypt is said to be the land of Osiris, as the Egyptians knew that there was a force that caused the plants to die and be reborn every year, and they called this force Asar aka Osiris. This is why Asar is depicted as green, which represents the vegetation. But the reason why this is important is because when Egyptians say that Wajet is the patron and protector of Lower Egypt, it is symbolic of the Kundalini, as the Kundalini lays dormant at the base of the spine. And Egypt being the land of Osiris, Lower Egypt would be Osiris's lower body. So it is symbolic of the Kundalini laying dormant at the base of the spine. So this just shows you how deep the Egyptians were and how their sciences and culture represent the principle of as above so below as within so without. In Egypt you also have the Dijed pillar which is the backbone of Osiris and is also associated with Ptah. The origin of the Dijed pillar comes from the Osirian resurrection myth where Asar was placed into a coffin then that coffin was sealed off by his brother Set. Then this coffin was thrown into the Nile. Then his body washed up on the shores of Syria and his body came to rest upright by an acacia tree. And this tree grew around Osiris and enveloped the coffin. Now this acacia tree gave off such a nice aroma that the king of Syria cut it down and made a pillar out of it for his palace. So the Dijed pillar symbolizes stability, as it is this pillar that the king uses to support his palace.
Also, because Osiris lays unconscious in the coffin, this means that his own spine is not keeping him upright, but it is this acacia tree. So this acacia tree is the backbone of Osiris that keeps him stable. So essentially, the Dijed pillar is the spinal cord of God, which supports all life. So in essence, the Dijed pillar represents your own spinal cord through which you are able to transmute the Kundalini energy. But the Dijed pillar comes from the Acacia tree which was rooted in earth. So the Dijed pillar is rooted in earth which corresponds to the Shashumna Nadi or more specifically the Brahma Nadi that begins in the root chakra which is associated with the earth element. Also in the resurrection myth, the Dijed pillar is taken into the king's palace. So the final destination of the Dijed pillar was in the king's palace. So what this means is that the final destination for the energy that is transmuted through the Dijed pillar is the king's palace. But the king is the ruler of the land. So the king is the god of the land. So in this case, the king's palace is the abode of God. So this corresponds to the video I did on the Kundalini where I showed you that the Kundalini manifests in the Hindu chakra which is the abode of Shiva, the abode of God which is the king's palace. Also, the twin serpents that are often depicted wrapped around the staff of Hermes is the goddess Aset and her twin sister the goddess Nebhet aka Neptis. In this case, they are known as Nepti, meaning the two ladies or the two serpents. Each serpent represents the upward and downward movement of the Kundalini serpent. So Nebhet represents the downward descent of the Kundalini and also the force of creation. Then Aset represents the upward ascent of the Kundalini and the force of dissolution. Because for those who have watched part 3 of my chakra series, you will remember when I told you that the chakras represent different principles of creation and when the Kundalini makes her ascent up the spine, she dissolves or absorbs these cosmic principles. But on the flip side, when the Kundalini makes her descent back down the spine, she restores these cosmic principles, which is symbolic of creation. So the ancients understood that the Kundalini had two natures. One was a creative force and the other was a more destructive force. Hence why they depicted the Kundalini as twin serpents entwined around a staff. Also, Oset and Nebhet are complementary opposites. Oset represents the fiery aspect and Nebhet represents the cooling aspect. So this is why when a person raises the Kundalini, there is a heat because they are dissolving the cosmic principles, which is essentially destruction. And the nature of destruction is fiery and chaotic, which is also why the Kundalini is often likened to a flame. But the descent of the Kundalini is the creation process where this destructive fire can now be cooled and calmed down. But the reason why this is important is because a lot of people will spread propaganda and say that the twin serpents around the staff of Hermes are the Ida and Pingala Nadis, as both of the Ida and Pingala have a fiery and cooling nature. But the reason why they say this is because the Ida and Pingala Nadis both connect to the Ajna Chakra, so they want you to believe that the Kundalini must manifest in the Ajna Chakra. When I already told you that the Kundalini manifests in the Hindu Chakra. Now, the Kundalini science in Egypt was known as the Aret Sekhem, which means serpent power. But the word Sekhem is synonymous with Sekhmet, and she is the fierce goddess that presides over this serpent power. This is synonymous in India with the goddess Kali, who is also a fierce goddess, who is represented as the Kundalini. But both Kali and Sekhmet are manifestations of the Divine Mother. Sekhmet is a manifestation of Hathor who is a manifestation of Oset. Also Sekhmet is the consort of Ptah and the Dijel pillar which represents the spinal column is also associated with Ptah. Also Ptah is often depicted holding a Dijel pillar combined with an Ankh and a Waz scepter. 
Now the Dijed pillar represents stability and the Ankh represents eternal life and the Waz scepter represents power. So when you put all of this together, the serpent power that is raised up the Dijed pillar or spinal column brings about eternal life. And eternal means last forever and life that lasts forever is called immortality. So the raising of the serpent power up the spinal column brings forth immortality. Also, there is another Egyptian word called Dejedu, which refers to the abode of Asar called the Duat or the astral plane. So in this sense, Dejedu means being stable or established in the spirit realm and that you have transcended the mundane existence and have knowledge of the above and also the below. Now, in Egypt, they believed in three planes of existence. The first being the earth plane, which they called Ta, then the second being the heavenly realm, which they called Pet, and the third being the netherworld or astral plane known as the Duat. So the first concept of heaven and how came from the Egyptians. But the Duat was not how from a religious sense, but it was a spiritual realm where the soul was judged. The Duat is the abode of Asar and also the home to other gods, goddesses, spirits and souls. Also the Egyptians believed that when the sun known as Ra would set in the west, it was carried by Asar in a solar boat through the Duat and every morning Asar would guide the sun to rise again in the east. But because people saw the sun descend beyond the horizon, they thought that the Duat was under the earth. So this is where the religious concept of how being under the earth came from, which was a misinterpretation of esoteric wisdom. As the Duat simply refers to the unseen realm, the spirit realm and the unconscious mind. But see, when a lot of people teach the three planes of existence, they will say that the bottom level is the Duat, the middle level is the Ta, and the upper level is the Pet. But that is actually an incorrect interpretation of their teaching, as this stems from the notion that the Duat is the underworld. But it is not the underworld in the sense that it is under the earth, but under meaning that it is behind the earth. So a more correct teaching would be to say that the Duat is the spiritual realm that is in between the earth and the heavenly realm. The Duat is the spiritual net that holds all the realms together. So in order for you to travel to the next realm, you must go through the Duat. So essentially the Duat is the abode of all spirits, gods and goddesses. And the Duat is their resting place when they are not in the physical or in the heavenly realm. So the Duat is not how, it is simply the place where all spirits will go to once they have made the transition from the earth plane. So for example, if we say that we have two cities, the first is called Ta and the other is called Pet. Now, you want to leave the first city called Ta, and in order for you to go to the next city called Pet, you have to travel via the train station. Now, that train station would be the Duat, and the train driver would be Asar. As the Duat is the abode of Asar, he is the god of the underworld. So, if you want to go to the heavenly realm, you must answer to Asar. But now, if you never gained a level of knowledge of self, when you died, then you wouldn't be able to get into the heavenly realm. Instead, you would just stay in the train station or the Duat. But that doesn't mean that the train station is evil, as that is the place that everyone goes to. But if you had knowledge of self, then you would get a pass to go to the heavenly realm. But if you don't have a pass to go to the heavenly realm, then you would simply stay in the Duat. So again, the Duat is not how, it is simply the place where all spirits and souls go to if they are not in the physical or in the heavenly realm. But getting into the pet is not based on righteousness, but more based on having a knowledge of self, as having a knowledge of self is essentially ma'at, because a knowledge of self is the knowledge of the spirit, and when a person has a knowledge of the spirit, they live righteously. But people who don't have a knowledge of the spirit, they don't live righteously because they identify only with the body. So they would discard righteousness for needs and desires of the body. 
So for the most part, all the spiritual people listening to this right now, we will be going to the pet realm once we make the transition. But I am not just saying that to make you feel good because the fact that you are spiritual means that you have gained a degree of knowledge of self. So that alone will take you into the pet realm. But then once you get into the pet realm, there are higher levels that you can reach. But those higher levels within the pet realm would be based on righteous deeds. So you would first have to know your spiritual mission. Then by working towards completing that mission will take you into the higher levels in the pet realm. But in some cases, the du'at can be seen as hell. Because I'm guessing that there will be quite a lot of pissed off souls and spirits in the du'at. Because they are probably regretting the negative lives that they may have lived and how they ignored the spiritual. Also imagine being stuck in a train station for 400 earth years. So one could only imagine that it would be hell. But saying that the du'at is a train station is just to give you a rough idea. But a train holds multiple people. But when you incarnate down here, you come on your own. So the du'at would most likely be a station with spiritual pods or dropships. And each dropship will incarnate you into a specific place on earth and to a specific family. So similar to a train that tells you where it is headed is the same with these spiritual pods. But also, if we go back to the Osirian resurrection myth, Asar was placed in a coffin that was specifically made for him. Then this coffin was thrown into the Nile. And while it was saying in the Nile, Asar was in a deep unconscious state and he was slowly dying. Then the coffin winds up on shore and rests against an acacia tree. So what this represents is the transition of consciousness. And that in order for you to go to the next stage in consciousness, you have to go through a period of suffering and you must travel through the unconscious. Also, the coffin that Asar was in was specifically made to fit his measurements. So what this means is that this conscious journey is individual, meaning that this journey specifically caters to your circumstances and not everyone's journey is the same. Now the Egyptians and many other ancient cultures believe that in the beginning of creation there was a cosmic ocean. The Egyptians called this cosmic ocean Nu. Now the Egyptians believe that out of the waters of Nu came forth a primal serpent that assisted in the creation of the universe. This primal serpent is known as Asha Heru which means many faces or one of many faces and this primal serpent has five heads which represents multiplicity and diversity. Also it is said that from the vibration of this primal serpent's body in the waters of Nu forms waves of varying shapes and sizes. Also in the Egyptian creation myth there is a solar bolt which is how the Neteru or cosmic principles come into being. The sailing of this boat symbolizes motion which equates to time as time only exists with motion. So the sailing of the boat indicates the existence of time and space through which the creation of the universe manifests. But this is further realized in an extract from the book of coming forth by day, AKA the book of the dead. It says this earth will return to the primeval waters to endless flood as in its first state. I Atum shall remain with Osiris after I have transformed myself into another snake, which men do not know and gods do not see. So basically, this extract is referring to the serpent life force which permeates this existence. But this life force is not seen as it is not physical, but it is a spiritual force that gives life to all things. Also, the Egyptians believe that at the end of the world, God or Atum reverts back to the form of a serpent. So this shows God existing in the beginning and in the end, which is identified by an image of a serpent biting its tail, showing how God is infinite and how this life giving energy constantly permeates this reality. In addition, you also have a serpent known as Apophis, which is the enemy of Ra and tries to stop his solar bow of creation. Now from this serpent is where the concept of the serpent being evil came from. Because in various depictions, Apophis is being subdued or even killed. 
but the Egyptians never had a concept of evil as the way people of today view evil. For example, a lot of people think that the god Set or Seti is evil, but Set simply represents the lower self or the ego self. And the god Heru would be the counterpart of Set who represents the higher self or the spirit. But when a person is operating on ego, they may act in negative ways, which brings about selfishness, greed, envy, and gluttony. So set isn't evil, but when a person is reacting to the impulse of set or the ego, it can make a person do negative things. But in the case of the serpent Apophis, it simply represents entropy or the force of chaos. Because in the beginning of creation, there was a primal serpent that permeated life through all things, which this can be considered to be order. But the Egyptians believed that God or a tomb also reverted back to a serpent at the end of creation. So now this same serpent that created the cosmos must now destroy it, which is a form of chaos. So it is not evil, but simply a natural element of nature. So this primal serpent bears the three powers of God, which is creation, preservation and destruction. Furthermore, another reason why the serpent Apophis is constantly being subdued is because the forces of chaos do not actually go away, they are constantly in effect. But it is the forces of order that keep that chaos in check. Now to make it more simpler, we can look at this from a perspective of the human body. For example, when it comes to the muscles, you have three types of contractions. You have the concentric contraction, which is where the muscle contracts and gets shorter. Then you have the eccentric contraction, where the muscles contract and gets longer. Then you have the isometric contraction, where the muscle contracts and stays the same length. So now, during a regular exercise, such as a bicep curl, when you curl your arm, that would be a concentric contraction as the bicep is contracted and becomes shorter. Then when you extend your arm, that would be the eccentric contraction as the bicep contracts and becomes longer. But anyone who has trained in the gym and you have done many repetitions of a bicep curl, you know that eventually your bicep gets to a point of fatigue and it becomes much harder to curl your arm. And the eccentric contraction becomes much easier than the concentric contraction. So now in the case of the serpent Apophis, he would be the eccentric contraction. As once the muscle becomes fatigued, you struggle to curl your arm. So it may feel like the eccentric contraction is having a battle with the concentric contraction, stopping you from curling your arm. But does this mean that the eccentric contraction is evil? Of course not. The eccentric contraction is simply a necessary part of the contraction process. So this shows you how the serpent Apophis is not evil, but he is a necessary part of the creation process. But also Set is often depicted as the one who subdues and defeats Apophis. But again, Set is not evil, he represents the ego self. And Set defeating Apophis is a metaphor of how the ego can be utilized for productivity rather than a detriment. Because if we go back to the analogy of the bicep curl, anybody who has trained in the gym knows that once you reach that fatigue state, you feel like you cannot get in another rep. But it is the pride and the ego that allows you to force out a few more reps. So in essence, it is the ego that allows you to overcome the eccentric contraction and get in another rep. So this is why it is Set who subdues and defeats Apophis, showing you how the ego can be used for positive gain and not just negative. So the Egyptians had a higher esoteric knowledge that they were able to encode into depictions. But people who don't have the level of consciousness to understand this high esoteric knowledge, they would just dismiss the serpent as evil. Lastly, the Egyptians also had a concept of the chakras, known as the Sefek Bara, which means the seven souls of Ra, or the seven arms of balance. Now the Sefek Bara comes from the Kenna Papyrus extracted from the Book of Coming Forth by Day, aka the Book of the Dead. But in the depiction, you have spheres lined up on the weighing scale, 
as these are also judged along with the heart. But the Egyptians believed in two concepts for the heart. One was the physical heart which pumps blood around the body and the other was known as the Hati which is the seat of divine intelligence, consciousness and individuality. This was the heart that was judged in the great hall of judgment. It is also said that Egyptian yoga would be based on the chakra points corresponding with the body of the sky goddess Nut. But going back to the depiction you see, the crocodile-like creature known as Amit, situated between the three lower chakras. And Amit, in the great hall of judgment, is the one who devours the heart, if it is not lighter than the feather. So what this means is that, a person whose consciousness is operating on the three lower chakras, they are dead, as they are unable to perceive consciousness as the heart chakra is the seat of consciousness. So unless a person is vibrating on or above the heart chakra, then they can't even perceive consciousness. So only when a person's consciousness passes the three lower chakras are they able to perceive consciousness which dwells in the heart. The next thing is that if you look closely at the papyrus, you will see Ma'at with her hand out, resting it under the sixth sphere, which this sixth sphere corresponds to the Ajna chakra. But Ma'at represents truth, justice and righteousness. So what this means is that the sixth chakra is seated in truth and righteousness. And like I told you in part two of my chakra series is that in order for you to activate the Ajna Chakra, you have to have a good reason to want to activate it and that reason being to want to help others. But another thing is that if you look closely at the depiction, you will see that there is actually eight chakras, possibly even nine chakras. But unfortunately, there is very little information surrounding the Kemetic Chakras. So the information I have mentioned above is pretty much the most I can decode about the Kemetic Chakras. In addition, it seems that the head of Anubis is above the scale, which symbolizes the discerning mind or the wise mind which presides over the chakras, which is the type of mind necessary to reach higher consciousness. But what's interesting to note is that the book of Coming Forth by Day, where this papyrus comes from, predates the Upanishads, which is a Vedic text that first mentions the chakras in India. So the Kemetic chakras are older than the Indian chakra system by at least 1000 years. So this is probably why there is less information surrounding the Kemetic chakras. All right, so let's go to the next one. The Serpents of Peru. The serpents in Peru were known as the Amaru, which means serpent. The Amaru was a mythological dragon-like serpent but Amaru was also used as a title by Inca priest kings. Another title often used by the Inca which denoted royalty was Tupac which means majestic. These titles were often used together such as Tupac Amaru which means majestic serpent. In fact the rapper Tupac Amaru Shakur was named after Tupac Amaru II who was the leader of a revolution against Spanish conquest in Peru. So in other words if you like Tupac but hate the serpent then that is a contradiction because Tupac knew that the serpent held divinity. There are even megalithic stone structures in Peru that are made in the likeness of a serpent. Also, some of the structures and artwork in Peru show very close similarities with ancient Egypt. Such as the concept of there being three planes of existence is also present in Peru, which they called Pacha, which can be translated as world or time and space. But the Incas also personified each plane with an animal. The highest plane is known as Hanan Pacha, which is the celestial plane and is personified by the condor bird. The middle plane is known as Kai Pacha, which refers to the surface of the earth, which is inhabited by humankind, animals and plants. This plane is personified by the puma cat. Then the lower plane is known as the Uku Pacha, which represents the underworld and is personified by the serpent. And to the Inca, the serpent was the most sacred animal and represented intelligence. Also, the Inca believed that the planes of existence would often interact with each other. 
For example, the interaction between the Hanan Pacha and the Kai Pacha was personified by elemental phenomena such as lightning and rainbows. Because lightning strikes down from above and a rainbow arches up into the sky and comes back down. But the Inca viewed the interaction with the Ukupacha and the Kaipacha to be caves and various openings in the earth, which they viewed as portals. The Inca also believed in a serpent creator deity, whom they called Viracocha. Viracocha is said to be the creator of all things, such as the sun, moon, earth and stars. The god Viracocha was said to have arose from the lake Titicaca during the time of darkness where he commanded the sun, moon and stars to emerge from the waters to bring forth light to this world. Viracocha is also a sun god and a god of the storms. Viracocha is often depicted wearing the sun for a crown, holding two serpents and with tears coming from his eyes. And these tears are said to be able to cause floods. But because of this, Viracocha is often called the Weeping God. So from this, you can see that the Inca creation myth is very similar to the creation myths of both India and Egypt, where the serpent arises from the primordial waters to bring forth everything in creation. Alright, so now let's take a look at some of the megalithic structures in Peru that are made in the likeness of a serpent. In this first picture taken from Cusco, Peru, the stones have been highlighted and what you have is megalithic stones arranged to form an image of a serpent, where you can see the serpent's eye, mouth and tail. In this next picture taken from Sacseuma, Peru, you see that the megalithic stones are arranged in what is supposed to be an anaconda. Here you can see the head of the serpent and also the body of the serpent. This next picture is also from Sacseuma. It depicts a serpent indented into a granite block. But what's interesting about this serpent is that there are seven indentations along the serpent's body which represent the seven chakras and the kundalini. So the knowledge of the Kundalini is not only present in India, but it was also present in Peru. In addition, the megalithic structures in Peru bear very close similarities to the megalithic structures located in Egypt. For instance, in Peru, you have large blocks of stones that are tightly packed together without the use of mortar or cement. This is the same architecture that built the pyramids in Giza, where you have large blocks of stone tightly packed together without the use of mortar or cement. But another interesting factor is the knobs protruding out of the stone. No one really knows what they are for, but they are present in all of the megalithic structures found in Peru. So now if we take a closer look at those knobs, Again, you see the tightly packed stones with the knobs protruding out, but this is also present in Egypt. Here you see the knobs protruding out of the stone in similar fashion to the megalithic structures found in Peru. But how do we explain how two cultures on two different landmasses bear such similar architectural traits? As there was no school teaching this type of architecture, let alone the same schools that were worldwide. So the only explanation is that they were literally the same people. Because in the book, The Return of the Serpents of Wisdom, it explains that there was a worldwide dragon culture. And that all of these people were from the same lineage. And they branched off to different parts of the world and carried this same culture with them. But these are not the only similarities that the Inca share with the Egyptians. There are also other cultural similarities which further prove that both cultures are in fact from the same lineage. But see, when it comes to the race of the Inca, archaeologists will say that they don't know the actual race of the Inca. But based on the fact that they share very close architectural traits and cultural traits with ancient Egypt, we can safely assume that the Inca were black and that they were from the same lineage of the Egyptians. Okay, so let's go to the next one. 
The Serpents of Mesoamerica. The Serpents of Mesoamerica were known as the Plumbed or Feathered Serpent, who the Mayans called Cucuclan, and who the Aztecs slash Toltecs called Quetzalcoatl. These feathered serpents were priest kings, spiritual teachers, and culture bearers. Now the feathers represent flight, so this symbolizes its transcendental aspect. Then the serpent represents earth because it crawls on the ground, so this is symbolic of matter. So the plum serpent is the union of spirit and matter, which is the personification of a god. There are also serpent motifs and artifacts throughout Mesoamerica, which show how important the symbol of the serpent was to these cultures. All right, first we have the Temple of the Cuckoo Clan, which is located in Chichen Itza, Yucatan, Mexico. Here you see two serpents at the base of the pyramid with their tongues sticking out and the bodies of the serpent travel up to the top of the pyramid. Also during an equinox and depending on the angle that the sun hits the pyramid, it actually forms something called a serpent effect where the shadows cast by the stairs of the pyramid give the impression of the serpent's body traveling to the top of the pyramid. Now, next we have a piece of Mayan artwork called the Mayan Vision Serpent. And in this picture, you see a being with a serpent lower body and a human upper body, which is synonymous with the Naga of India, which is depicted with a serpent lower body and a human upper body, which represents its androgynous nature, which is the union of the masculine and the feminine. But a depiction like this would be symbolic of the Kundalini awakening. So what this means is that not only is the science of Kundalini present in India, Egypt and Peru, but it is also present in the Mayan culture. So all these people talking about Kundalini is Hinduism don't know what the hell they are talking about. Also in this picture you see that the serpent seems to arise out of a plant. But the symbol of the plant is also used in India where they have a lotus flower emanating from the navel of the god Vishnu which brings forth the god Brahma. But the symbol of the lotus flower is also present in Egypt so this lotus flower symbolizes rebirth and renewal. But what this also means is that all of these cultures are connected based on the fact that similar symbolism was used throughout their artwork. Another important factor is the symbols you see around the picture, which is the Mayan writing system, which is similar to the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt. Furthermore, the Mayans also had a concept for chi, which they called kopaya, or lightning in the blood. So the Mayans understood that the spirit was in the blood, and the nature of one's spirit is determined by their bloodline. So this is why secret societies are based on bloodlines because that is how you can be assured that the secrecy of the organization will be kept as the nature of that person's spirit would be the same as the other people from that bloodline. So the matter of trust isn't really an issue because they are from the same bloodline. Now in this next picture, we see a depiction of a feathered serpent from the temple of the Quetzalcoatl which is a pyramid structure located in Teotihuacan, Mexico. But what's interesting is that in this picture you also see what seems to be a pine cone and the pine cone is symbolic of the pineal gland. So this could represent the Kundalini's manifestation in the pineal gland. But what's interesting is that there is also another picture called the statue of the Quetzalcoatl. And in this picture you see a feathered serpent with a man's head coming out of its mouth, which again represents its androgynous nature and the union of the masculine and the feminine. But what's most profound is that this feathered serpent is coiled three and a half times. But where have you heard this before? See, this is the same in India where the Kundalini is said to coil three and a half times around the root chakra. But it goes even deeper because if you notice in the picture, hanging from the serpent's tongue is a set of pine cones and the pine cone is symbolic of the pineal gland. 
But see, when you eat food, the first point of contact for the food is the tongue. So what this means is that the first point of contact or the destination for this serpent is the pineal gland. But wait, there's more. Because here is another picture also called the statue of the Quetzalcoatl, And in this picture, you see a man holding entwined serpents in his hand, which is synonymous with the staff of Hermes or the staff of Tehuti, which represents the ascent of the Kundalini. So what this means is that the science of the Kundalini was not only present in India, Egypt, Peru and the Mayans but it was also present in the Aztec culture. So again, all these people talking about the Kundalini is Hinduism, you're teaching Hinduism, don't know what the hell they are talking about. Alright, so now there is one more thing that we need to touch on which is the Olmecs. Now most people when they hear the word Olmec, the first thing that comes to mind is the massive stone heads. But see, there was an Olmec exhibit that was taking place in the United States in 2010. But the exhibit is no longer available. But instead, they created a book called Olmec Colossal Masterworks of Ancient Mexico. And in this exhibit, they showed more Olmec artifacts. One of which was this particular artifact. But I want you to pay close attention to the headdress that this person is wearing. Also notice the circular earrings. Now I want you to take a look at this. Which is a Mayan high priest. Now again notice the headdress and the circular earrings. Now tell me what's the difference. See if I never told you that these were different would you be able to tell these two apart? Of course not, that's because the truth is that there is no Olmec, it all belongs to the Mayan culture. But what's interesting is that if you take a look at this, which is a map of the Gulf of Mexico, you see that the Mayan, Aztec and the Olmec cultures are literally on the same landmass. But see, when I was looking for a map, I could either find one that showed the Mayan and the Aztec or one that showed the Olmec and the Mayan, but never one that showed all three. So this one, I had to edit it myself, hence why the font looks slightly different. But the reason why you can't find a map that clearly shows all three cultures is because it looks kind of funny. It looks kind of funny to say that all of these cultures are literally within walking distance of each other, but then you want to try and tell me that they are different cultures. So the truth is that it is all one culture and the so-called white man separated the cultures and called each one of them Olmec, Mayan and Aztec when they are all literally from the same lineage, hence why their cultures bear striking similarities. For example, separating all of these cultures from each other is like separating Lower Egypt from Upper Egypt and saying that they are different cultures when really they are the same people but just on two different sides of the landmass. But the reason why he did this is because the Olmecs are undoubtedly black. But if you found out that there is really no Olmec and that it all belongs to the Mayan culture and the Mayan culture being related to the Aztec culture and if the Olmecs were black then what does that say about the Mayans and the Aztecs? They were also black. So this is another stolen legacy. Alright so let's go to the next one. The Serpent and the Moors. Now, I managed to find a link between the serpent and the moors. And the evidence that I have found in contrast to the previous slides proves that the moors identified with the serpent. But before we get into the evidence, let's get a quick recap on who the moors are. The historical moors were a group of black sub-Saharan Africans situated in Morocco. These Moors came into Europe during the Dark Ages and ruled for over 700 years. During this time, the Moors taught the Europeans how to read, write, they taught them basic hygiene, science, mathematics and they brought into Europe various different African traditions that shaped the modern Western culture as we know it today. One of those traditions was fashion. The Moors brought fashion into Europe. 
but specifically to Italy. In Italy, the Moors set up a lot of prestigious learning facilities and they brought in exquisite fabrics such as satin and silk. So because of the strong Moorish presence in Italy, it is now renowned as the center of quality fashion and designer clothing. But one significant piece of fashion is the alligator loafers, which is a common type of shoe known for in Italy. But if we take a look at this map, which shows the locations of crocodilian species, we can see that the alligator is not native to Italy. The alligator is a native animal to Africa. So it would have been the Moors who brought in the alligator loafers. But it goes even deeper than that. Because if we take a look at another map, it shows how the Moors traveled from location in Morocco and went into Spain. But if we take a closer look at the previous map, we can see that the crocodilian species is not native to Morocco. The animals that are native to Morocco are lions, elephants, whales, cheetahs, hyenas and gazelles. So the only nearest place to the Moors that has the crocodilian species is Mauritania. So the Moors would have had to have traveled all the way to Mauritania just to get those crocodilian skins to make the shoes. So the reason why this is important is because the fact that the crocodilian species is not native to Morocco means that you can't pull the argument and say that maybe the crocodiles were just lying around. But that can't be because they are not native to the land. But see, what's most important about this is that in this society, a person's footwear is an identifier of wealth and a person's overall social status. But see, in Italy, the alligator loafer is seen as the highest quality shoe that a man can buy. As when a person wants to showcase their wealth, they would purchase an alligator loafer made in Italy. But the question we must ask ourselves is, why did the Moors decide to make shoes out of an alligator, which is a reptile? Why did they not make shoes out of a lion skin or the gazelle skin? As those are animals that are native to Morocco. The crocodile is not a native animal to Morocco. So why did the Moors specifically choose to make shoes out of the reptile skin? Yes, the Moors may have also utilized the skins of the lions and the gazelle, but the fact that the alligator loafers are so highly esteemed in Italy, which is a place where the Moors have such a strong presence, the only explanation for this is because those were the shoes that the Moors were wearing. So it is only natural that those shoes would still to this day be highly regarded as the highest quality shoes that a man can buy. So again, the question is, why would the Moors go out of their way to acquire the crocodilian skins to make their shoes from? What was so special about the crocodilian species? But interestingly enough, the crocodile is represented in Egypt as the god Sebek. So this may have been where the Moors learned of the divinity of the crocodile. The crocodile Sebek is a manifestation of the primal serpent that arose from the primordial waters of Nu to create the universe. Sebek was also merged with the god Ra to form Sebek Ra. Sebek was associated with military fertility and was also a protective deity for the Nile River. Furthermore, the Egyptians created a man-made lake by draining the river of the Fayum province. This lake was called Lake Moiris. Here the Egyptians founded a city called Crocodiliopolis and this city became the capital of Egypt in the 12th dynasty. Crocodiliopolis was located in the most fertile region of Egypt and thus became a haven for farmers to grow vegetation. Because of this, the god Sebek was also associated with fertility. But the people of Crocodiliopolis worshipped Sebek through the manifestation of a live crocodile who they kept in a sacred enclosure with a pond and sand. In this enclosure, the priest treated the crocodile as a pet and they fed it regularly. But when that crocodile died, it was mummified and given a special burial. Then the enclosure would have been replaced with another crocodile. Also, Sebek has a serpent wife called Renen Utet, 
who is the protector of the harvest and granaries. But why would a crocodile have a serpent wife? So this further proves that the god Sebek is a manifestation of the primal serpent. So the Moors understood that the serpent was a symbol of wealth and they wanted to portray their wealth and abundance by creating shoes out of an animal that is associated with wealth. So this underlines that the Moors saw divinity within the serpent and they never believed that it was evil but rather that it was a symbol of divinity. So all of this information that I have brought forth to you shows how these great black civilizations saw the reptile as the highest symbol on the planet which represents fertility, immortality, wealth and power. But this also shows you how the Moors, the Egyptians, the Inca, the Mayans, the Aztecs and the original inhabitants of Asia were the same people as they all saw the same divinity within the serpent. So now if you are a black person and you don't acknowledge the symbol of the serpent or you even hate the serpent then that must mean that your lineage can't come from the Moors, your lineage can't come from all of the cultures that I have shown you in this video as those civilizations saw the serpent as the highest divinity on the planet. So if you are a black person and you don't acknowledge the serpent, then maybe this is where your lineage comes from. This right here must be where your ancestors are descended from as the Moors and the Egyptians never did any of this stuff. So again, if you think that the serpent is evil, then maybe this is where your ancestors are descended from, homie. So the point here is that we need to acknowledge why the symbol of the serpent was used by the ancients and understand that they viewed the serpent as the highest divinity on this planet. So you don't have to like the animal itself, you just have to acknowledge the symbol and why it was used. Okay, now all of this would be incomplete unless I deal with the serpent in the Bible. So let's go into the Bible.